This show is a part of the podcast network of the Walled Garden Philosophical Society, an international community of philosophers and seekers dedicated to the pursuit of truth, wisdom, virtue, and the divine, wherever they may be found. To find out more, go to thewalledgarden.com. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Soul Searching with Seneca. Now, in today's episode, we're focusing on Seneca's letter number 12 on old age. And I'm going to skip over the reading of uh, the first few verses, but I'm going to be focusing today just on verses 4 to 6. But so that you're aware of what happens in those first few verses, he basically tells us the story of uh, him visiting his country home uh, that he hasn't been to in a while. And he's seeing these signs of decay everywhere. He's seeing uh, these signs that he is getting older all around him, right? And, And so, you know, things are falling apart. He's seeing people who he knew from his childhood and uh, from his earlier years who are much older now. And so uh, he's finally kind of, I guess, waking up to the fact that he's uh, nearing the, the end point of his life. And he does this, he talks about this in order to set us up for this conversation. So uh, he says the following, quote, Let us cherish and love old age, for it is full of pleasure if one knows how to use it. Fruits are most welcome when almost over. Youth is most charming at its close. The last drink delights the toper, the glass which souses him and puts the finishing touch on his drunkenness. Each pleasure reserves to the end the greatest delights which it contains. Life is most delightful when it is on its downward slope, but has not yet reached the abrupt decline. I myself believe that the period which stands, so to speak, on the edge of the roof, possesses pleasures of its own, or else the fact of our not wanting pleasures has taken the place of the pleasures themselves. How comforting it is to have tired out one's appetites, and to have done away with them. But, you say, it is a nuisance to be looking death in the face. Death, however, should be looked in the face by young and old alike. We are not summoned according to our rating on the censors list. Moreover, no one is so old that it would be improper for him to hope for another day of existence. And one day, mind you, is a stage on life's journey. End quote. So these are the only verses we're focusing on today, but there's so much more to talk about in this letter. It's, it's, it's really a, a wonderful uh, piece of writing. Uh, but in these few verses, there's so much to focus on, right? So uh, I, I want to focus first on a couple of themes that we see throughout these few verses. And it's something that I've been wrestling with in my own writing lately. So it, it kind of, it's, it's good timing that I'm coming across these verses here. But he says, you know, let us cherish old age, for it is full of pleasure if one knows how to use it. And then you see this theme continued down here. He says, uh, I myself believe that the period which stands, so to speak, on the edge of the roof, possesses pleasures of its own, or else the very fact of our not wanting pleasures has taken place of the pleasures themselves. Now, this I see as, as kind of a theme which runs through Stoicism. You know, we can often think that Stoicism is, is encouraging us to uh, essentially scorn pleasure, you know, and move towards better things. But in a sense, I have a suspicion that, that what is happening in this philosophy and in Seneca's philosophy in particular as well is uh, trying to encourage us to find the pleasure that exists in the natural flow of life and in a life that is aimed at good things, the highest possible good, right? There is pleasure in virtue. There is pleasure in honor, in duty, you know, in courage, in justice, in temperance, in wisdom. You know, there is, there is true pleasure that we can feel by engaging with these virtues and with the, the natural flow of our life. And Seneca is saying here, listen, everything has its time and season. And if we learn to flow with those seasons, we will, we will kind of see the, the key, I guess, uh, to the pleasure which exists within those times and seasons. It's funny, he says that each pleasure reserves to the end the greatest delights which it contains. 
And he says that life is most delightful when it is on its downward slope, but has not yet reached the abrupt decline. Now, obviously, uh, when I read something like this, I think, well, I don't quite have access to that wisdom that naturally comes with age, or at least the natural wisdom that comes with old age. However, uh, you know, I do hope that I'm able to embody this kind of wisdom that Seneca is talking about throughout the rest of my life, finding the pleasure, finding the natural flow of the seasons uh, and the times in my life and what they mean for me and, and also how they relate to the whole of my life. Right, and, and I think that there's some really beautiful advice that he gives here down the bottom that really uh, brings all of this together, right? He says that death should be looked in the face by young and old alike. And this is really the key, right? Now, you can let yourself fall into the natural wisdom that comes with age, like we've talked about with Seneca's writings before, uh, but you can also kind of skip the steps and you can really start to contemplate these stages in your life uh, from a young age. And you can and should start to think about death from a young age, uh, right, so that you are prepared and so that you don't have to wait until the time when you are forced to think about death by necessity. Because by that time, uh, it may frighten you far more than you may have realized in your youth. But if you've come uh, into acquaintance with this idea of death throughout your entire life and you have, and you have remembered what it means that you die, uh, then you're not going be, to be so surprised when you reach that point in your life that Seneca was at when he was writing this. And you're going to be able to find the pleasure in that point of life if you have contemplated your mortality to a sufficient degree. And one of the reasons why I've found these few passages to be uh, uh, really fascinating is because they they, they really harmonize beautifully with an idea that Carl Jung talked about. So, Jung, as far as I can understand this idea, uh, believed that we could very much see our lives through the lens of the structure of a day. Uh, and, and, and what he meant by this was, you know, you look at what the sun does throughout the day and you see that it rises in the morning and then it gains strength increasingly until the midday sun, at which point it stops gaining strength and actually weakens through the rest of the day uh, until it finally sets. And you could see this uh, very much in the same vein of, 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 of the structure of our lives, right? Because we are born and we have that kind of youthful spirit, that youthful engagement with life. Life where for the first half of our life, we are very much trying to put ourselves together and strengthen ourselves uh, amidst our culture, right? And, uh, and so, we're, you know, educating ourselves, we're trying new things, we're exploring the world, we're exploring our possibility, we're setting up the family unit, we're setting up our careers, we're setting up all these things around us. Uh, and, and that is very much the, 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 the necessary and proper uh, way to deal with the first half of our lives. But then Jung suggests that, okay, there comes a point in our lives that's almost like that midday point, right? And he suggests that we almost go through somewhat of a second puberty uh, where we realize that no longer will that youthful spirit uh, uh, be necessarily the guide of our lives, but rather uh, what's going to happen is that for the next half of our lives, we will be on that downward slope towards our death. And in order for us to find meaning in that second half of our lives, we have to deal with and grapple with uh, that question of what does it mean that I die, right? And so we gain a deeper wisdom. And the way that he put it was that, you know, we were seeking these external rewards for the first half of our lives, but that we would then have to go within ourselves and find a deeper wisdom in that second half of our lives when we are essentially sliding down that slope towards our death. And, you know, Jung believed that you could kind of categorize our lives into nature and culture, meaning uh, that, you know, the first half of our lives kind of belonged to the natural impulses, uh, while the second half of our lives was aided by by our culture, which teaches us uh, deep wisdom about what it means to be human and what it means to die, right? And he said something very interesting here, which I think pairs the ideas that he's talking about with Seneca's ideas very, very well. He said... The solution of the problem lies not in the conversion into the opposite, but in the retaining of the former values together with a recognition of their opposites. This naturally means conflict and division within oneself, and it is intelligible that one should shrink from it, psychologically as well as morally. 
Therefore, more often than a conversion into opposite, a rigid stiffening in the viewpoint previously held is sought as a solution. Now, this is unbelievably interesting, right? And if you get this point, if you really understand this, it's going to save you a a lot of trouble in your life, right? Jung believed that one of the necessary steps in a a person's life was when they integrated their youthful spirit, their youthful enthusiasms, right, that they lost as they were enculturating themselves into their society, right, that when when you integrate those youthful enthusiasms with a deeper wisdom about your culture, right, with a deeper wisdom about what it means to die, with about what it means to be a part of your society, when you can merge those two together, that is a perfect harmony that leads to kind of psychological and moral health, right? But if you just follow the natural stages of life, what opt- often happens when you don't actually think about it in this way and when you just let it happen, you know, you can see either the extreme example of the, the youthful person who sees no value in, in the culture of their, their ancestors, who sees no value in the ideas of their elders, right? Or on the opposite extreme, you can see the elderly person who sees no value in the youth of today and the youthful ideas that are coming up. But a natural pairing is supposed to be harmonious between between those two opposites, right? Where you have that youthful enthusiasm, and yet you still understand the deeper wisdom of your culture. And so, you pair this with Seneca's idea, and he's saying, listen, there is pleasure in old age. There is pleasure in that downward slope, right? And, and that you don't need to wait until you get there in order to see the value in that time of your life, right? Because you should be contemplating death whenever you, you know, come across that idea in the first place. You should be as, as young as possible contemplating these ideas of, which, which are taught to you uh, by your culture and through your culture, right? And, and Seneca often talks about, you know, there's a great quote um, where he says, you know, hold on to your youthful enthusiasms because they'll be useful to you in your old age. This guy was talking about these ideas that Carl Jung discusses ages ago. You know, he, he was talking about the very same thing, about pairing those two opposites and having a harmonious relationship uh, with, with, with those two opposites, you know, b- between culture and nature, between deeper wisdom and youthful enthusiasm. And that is such a necessary idea. And I just thought it was uh, quite profound that these two ideas kind of pair well together, that there's, there's almost a conversation between Carl Jung and Seneca's writings if you see the signs uh, between them. So, uh, you know, again, I just, I love these few verses from Seneca. I think that they, they are deep wisdom. Uh, and, and I think that the more we can learn to uh, fall into those stages in our life naturally and to see the pleasure that exists in, in all the stages of our life and the necessity that exists within all of those stages of our life, the, the necessity of going through those stages and those times. And if we can learn to, to, to hold on to what is great about each stage of our life, right, and to pair it with the next stage, I think that that's such a, a profound idea that uh, will allow you to flow through life and to keep what is amazing about each stage uh, and, and to, to let the dead wood burn off. And so, I hope you found a few interesting ideas in this episode. I've certainly had a fun time exploring these ideas, and uh, I'm really excited to go through the, the rest of this letter because it, it gets really deep and there's some, some uh, really fascinating uh, ideas that Seneca discusses here. And I may even jump back into Carl Jung for the rest of the, the letter to kind of compare different thoughts that I've been reading from Jung because, uh, because there's definitely a lot of overlap there, and, uh, and it's fascinating to see that. So, anyway... Once again, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I'll talk to you next time.